Hello and welcome along. It's Al here from Al's Geek Lab. I hope you are keeping well. First of all, in September we had Sep Tandy and now we have Dossember. And so uh, the community has gotten together to make this. Basically, anybody who has some video content about how to do things with DOS-based machines. And as you know, if you're a follower of my channel, then uh, you know that I've got a lot of stuff to do with old DOS-based machines. I had originally made this video a while back, so if you're an avid fan of my channel, then you'll know what this video is all about. But I thought I'd edit it down for a dos -ember. Basically, if you want to be able to use Twitter or email or web browsing or stuff like that from a computer of this sort of vintage on a modern day network with MS-DOS, how in the heck do you do that? I'll try and break it down and make it as easy as possible. It's still not super easy, but I'm going to show you how I've achieved it and how it works actually really surprisingly well. <laughs> Setting up networking on MS-DOS is about as fun as sticking your head in the washing machine and switching on to Maxi Wash Cycle. Today I'm going to be showing you 10 steps in true YouTube fashion in how to make it a breeze. Well, when I say a breeze, I mean something between hurricane level and a light wind. So nowadays, we're used to networking being plug and play, but with DOS-based PCs, networking can often become not working. Fortunately, there are a bunch of new apps and drivers out there, including ones made in 2020. That makes life a lot more palatable. So I'm going to talk you through all of the steps so you can get your old bit of vintage kit kicking and screaming into the second decade of the 21st century, or maybe at least the 1990s. First things first, you may be wondering why in the hell I'd even want to do networking on my old bit of kit. Well, firstly, here's a few things that I would use as a networking setup. One, I could transfer files via FTP from my new laptop to my old retro pieces of kit. Secondly, I could connect it to my Raspberry Pi, and that runs Linux. I can then do a whole host of useful things like run text mode web browsers, email clients, and also Twitter as well, things like that. I'll show you that later. Uh, I could also use IRC chat uh, to chat with fellow geeks. <clears throat> I mean, really nice, normal people on the internet. Uh, and then uh, I could also use text mode web browsers natively to surf the web. I could also connect to awesome bulletin board systems or BBSs as you may know them and chat with people and play online games. I could maybe use SSH, and that's a big maybe, so we'll see if we can get that working later on. And then finally, I could use Telnet to connect to other online services or perform network diagnostics with tools such as Netcat and Ping. There are literally heaps of other cool things that you can do with a machine that was made way before the World Wide Web even existed. But I don't all want you thinking this is DOS based only. You can check my channel out for some really old videos that I've done and you'll see I've done similar things with, uh, with computers such as the Apple II. So now that you're along for the ride, here's the main steps to this journey in true YouTube countdown fashion. Number 10. Get yourself a network card or a simulated adapter that will work with MS-DOS and Michael Brutman's MTCP software. More on that later. Number nine, install the network card into your PC. All of those lovely jumpers. And no, I'm not talking about those woolen things you get at Christmas time here. Number eight, download the network packet driver for your network card. Number seven, download the MTCP software. Number six, Copy the packet driver and the MTCP software to your retro PC. This sounds really easy, doesn't it? Number five, copy the packet driver. Number four, configure the MTCP software. Number three, get an IP with DHCP. Number two, 
optionally make a wee batch file to set it up every time that you start your computer. And number one, have lots of networky fun, of course. Set up Telnet D, of course. Here are some ideal Ethernet adapters that are known to work with this solution. The 3Com 3C503 and the 3C509. The Zircom PE310BT, which is a parallel port adapter. And Novell NE1000, NE2000 and its clones. The Western Digital or SMC8003 series. The Intel AetherExpress 8-16. The Davicom DM908F the Linksys PCI cards, and of course a slip slash PPP connections using the Ether slip. This basically emulates Ethernet using a serial or modem connection. Right, step two, install that network card into your PC. I myself have a 3Com 3C503. Here's a quick look at my card. So this is my card here. I thought I'd just uh, give it a quick show and tell. Uh, there are many other cards out there that will work with DOS, but I thought this card is, uh, I went for this card myself, knowing that it works really well with DOS. It is a 3Com Etherlink 2, uh, 3C503-16-TP to be precise. So the 3C503 is well known to be uh, a good one. So it's an Ethernet card, just to be precise. It's got the AUI transceiver type connector, but more importantly, it's got Ethernet. Obviously, you get 10 base T, which has um, sort of BNC connector. So ideally, you want something with Ethernet, so it plugs straight into a, a modern network. All right, so there's a few things you need to know about this card. Obviously, if you have another card, Things will probably be similar, but obviously not the same. The jumper settings are the main thing to watch out for. And there's one, two, three sets of jumpers. At the top is the IO base address. So this is basically the area in RAM where you'll um, address this card. So this one here is set for two, eight, uh, 250, rather. So it's 250H is where this card is accessed. And then this, this is also a memory address and this starts at C8000 all the way down to DC1000. And at the moment you can see that this is set to the disabled position. This is the memory address of the BIOS itself. So obviously as there's no BIOS, the setting is disabled. You saw all of those jumper settings on that card. If you want to find the jumper settings layout for your card, have a look at this website. It's called statson.org. It's probably got what you're after. So the main thing to do is set the IO base address of the card, the area and RAM where your computer can talk to the Ethernet card. Take a note of the setting and pop that card inside your retro PC. As you saw, my card is set to address 250H. Make sure that whatever address you set your card to, it doesn't overlap with the address of any other card in your PC. Otherwise, bad things will happen. Next, what you've got to do is grab the packet driver. To get the packet driver, you probably want to go to a network called the internet. On that network, there's a thing called the World Wide Web. You'll be able to use this tool to visit a web site like kernwinner.com. C R Y N W R dot com. Anyway, don't worry about it. You'll find all the uh, websites for all of this stuff in the show's description. Hopefully, ye shall find the MS DOS drivers for the network card that you have in your grubby little mitts. Next step is step four download the NTCP software. Still on that interconnected network there? Good you'll be able to visit a website called Brutman.com. Now, I cannot stress this point enough. Michael Brutman is a genius. He developed a whole suite of modern day TCP applications for DOS. His goal was to make these applications work on an IBM PC with 4.77 MHz CPU or better, and not only do that, get it all working in 256K of RAM. 
where you think about all of the overhead that modern network apps have, fitting it into anywhere between 96 and 256k of RAM is some pretty clever stuff. The apps that you'll find on this one megabyte bundle include an FTP client to transfer files either between your local network or over the internet. FTP SRV is an FTP server which I mainly use to transfer files to my retro PCs. Then there's Telnet and this allows you to connect to remote servers and services. For example, I have a Raspberry Pi with the Telnet D server on it. When I Telnet into the Raspberry Pi, which is a Linux box, I can use it for many applications such as Twitter, text-based web browsers and email clients. With Telnet you can also connect to old school BBSs. I'll give you some more information on that later on. Next up there's IRC Junior, which is an IRC client so you can get your chat on with other IRC users on the net. Next, HTTP Serve, which is a web server so you can serve up web pages from your retro PC. Crazy, I know. Then there's HTTP Get. This tool allows you to download raw web pages, kind of like wget or curl if you know them in the Linux space. Next, there's Netcat, which is the utility which allows you to send any raw data over the network. Then there's some more rudimentary network tools, which are DHCP. And just in case you don't know, this is the protocol that gives you your IP address. It means you don't have to statically assign one. Next up, Packet Tool, a packet sniffer and diagnostic tool for packet drivers. And finally, SNTP. It sets the clock on your PC using internet time servers with the network time protocol. The MTCP apps are the most common out there, being released in January of 2020. However, there are plenty of other apps which are still worth a whirl. I'll do a little bit of coverage on these ones later. For example, Threads DOS Internet Software, which includes the DOS Link web browser and SSH DOS, the SSH client for DOS. Step 5. Transferring the files. All right, is this a case of chicken and egg? How do we get our networking software onto our old PC without having a network? Well, I have a few options for you. Let's try this one first. So if your new computer that you want to transfer the files from has just a USB port, then you can use one of these, hopefully. This is a USB cable. This is a floppy disk drive. If you have a three and a half inch floppy disk drive on your old computer, then this is probably the easiest method. Copy the MTCP and the packet driver onto the floppy disk, take said floppy disk out of this drive, and then put it into the floppy disk drive of your old computer. Job is a good one. If that's not an option for you, then this could be an option. It's got an RS-232 cable on the far end and a USB cable on the other end. This allows you to transfer files from your new computer to your old computer via USB and then into RS-232 port on the old side. So just a fairly straightforward null modem cable. This, um, this one, the model is HXSP-2108D. You can pick it up anyway on Amazon for about 15 bucks. Now it's time for step six, configure the packet driver. Depending on which network card you have, you'll need to set up the software interrupt number, the IRQ, and the I.O. address, but newer cards such as the 3C509 only require the software interrupt number. A common software interrupt number is 0 times 60 The configuration for the 3C503 adapter is 3C503, 0 times 60 3, 0 times 250 1 and This means the software interrupt is 0 times 60 the IRQ is 3 and the I.O. address is 0 times 250 The number 1 at the end is to force the driver to use the RJ45 transceiver, although that's probably not necessary. Next is step 7. Configure the MTCP software. Once you've unzipped the MTCP software, I put mine in the directory called net on the C drive, you'll find a subdirectory called samples. In there you'll find two files ftppass.txt and sample.cfg. 
make a copy of sample.cfg in the main TCP directory by typing copy sample.cfg dot dot backslash mtcp dot cfg or something like that. You'll also want this FTP pass.txt file probably in your root directory. So do so like so. Copy FTP pass.txt C colon backslash and edit that file by typing edit C colon backslash net backslash mtcp dot cfg. You'll see that there's a few options that you can change. First up, there's the packet interrupt setting. By default, it's set at 0 times 60. If you chose anything else different in step 5, then change the value here. Hostname is set to my DOS machine. Feel free to change this to something that you prefer. If you're going to use IRC Junior IRC chat client, then choose a nickname, a username and your real name that you would like to use for the following options listed there. There are also a few other configurable options for IRC Junior that you can tweak if you want. I left them alone, however. Going down the file further, there's a line that reads FTP SRV password file. It's commented out with a hash. Remove the hash. Unless you're going to set a static IP address, you can save the file and exit your editor. If you're going to set a static IP address, then you can change the entries at the bottom of the file. Make sure that you choose an IP address that doesn't conflict with any other IP addresses on your network. If you can, reserve an IP address or a few IP addresses to use statically. Next, you're going to want to edit the file c colon backslash ftp pass dot txt. All you want to do is set up a user and probably just allow full access to your computer's C drive. In the example here, I've set up a user called Al's Geek Lab with a password of just password, allowing all access. Finally, you want to tell your computer where MTCP is located on your computer. So type edit c colon backslash autoexec bat and the following line at the end of the file. Set MTCP CFG equals c colon backslash net backslash MTCP dot CFG. Step 8. Get an IP address with DHCP. We're on the home stretch now, everyone. So reboot your computer and fingers crossed, both the packet driver and the MTCP software are now ready to go. Start your packet driver as you did before, and then hopefully you get no errors. If not, let's proceed to set up your IP address. If you chose to automatically get an IP address from your router, then you can use DHCP.exe uh, to get sorted. And this is probably what you want. For example, type cd backslash net and then type DHCP. Any luck, after a few seconds, you'll be offered an IP address by your router. You'll see it, your assigned IP address, which you may want to take note of. And then you'll see a message saying, good news everyone. Obviously, Michael Brutman knows what a chore IP networking in DOS is. If you set a static IP address, you don't need to do anything at this point. DHCP is not required and the MTCP programs should just work. To test MTCP, try running htget just to test it out. For example, htget http colon slash slash www.brutman.com. After a few seconds, it should just show you the raw HTML text of Michael Brutman's homepage. If you've got problems, have a look at the output of the PC starting up. Did the packet driver make any wobbles when it was starting up? Perhaps you didn't set the packet driver settings to match the jumper settings on your card. Step 9. Setting up a batch file to start your networking. Now I assume that everything went well with the previous step, so you can make a little batch file to set up everything automatically for you, so you don't have to remember everything. Now I don't put this in autoexec.bat simply because I don't always use network software, so I want to keep my RAM free for other programs. I made a simple batch file called gotcp.bat. Here's the contents. Step 10. Have lots of networky fun. This is the part that you've been waiting for after all this effort, so now let's check everything out. Now that MTCP is working, there's lots of things that you can do, as I've said before. The most important is the ability to easily get files from your new computer to your old computer over the network. Therefore, let's check out FTP. I downloaded FileZilla on my PC, which is a free FTP client. Now this may be a little bit hard to see, but 
just for uh, example's sake, on the left here we have an old retro machine and it's uh, showing my current IP address which was leased to it by DHCP as 192.168.1.73. Now I'll start up the FTP SRV file which is the Michael Brutman FTP server. It's found the config file, the FTP pass.txt file. Everything looks reasonable, it says. So far, so good. And then on the right hand side here is a modern PC, and I'll try and connect to the machine here. So I've just set it up with my uh, host 192.168.1.73 and the username and password which I have configured in the FTP pass.txt file. One thing to note is that you have to use. Um, plain FTP which as it says here is insecure that's okay we're only doing it across our own local network so let's not worry about that press connect and hopefully you get that little beep from your um, your old PC and then we can see there's now drive C on the right hand side this is showing the uh, the hard disk drive of the old PC on the left hand side we're seeing the hard disk drive of our new PC. So we just go into drive C there and hopefully we get all the files which are in the drive C. Indeed we do. And then I want to go in and I would like to go into the drivers folder because I have some drivers over here I would like to transfer over. So it's as simple as dragging and dropping the files that you would like to have. So I'll just drag this file here and the file, file transfer is finished. The FTP serve tool is probably the MTCP tool that I use the most, simply because I'm always transferring DOS games and apps that I download from the net onto my old PC. So that was FTP serve. Next up is the FTP tool. It's equivalent to FileZilla for your old PC, except it's command line driven. Use commands like dir to show directories, cd to change directories and get to download files. I have a lot of fun with IRC Junior talking to people in the vintage computing vc forum on slashnet.org. There are around 600 IRC chat networks and hundreds of thousands of chat channels still in operation today. Typically 400,000 people use IRC every day. There are chat channels on pretty much any subject. So if you don't already use IRC, what's not to love about getting your chat on with people across the world, all from the uber geekiness of a DOS-based IRC client on your retro PC? Of course it is possible to browse that big old World Wide Web using a web browser in MS-DOS rather than going through a Linux Telnet jump host. If you're on some old hardware like an 8088, then be prepared to wait for a long time for anything to come up on your screen. And of course, don't expect SSL support. At the time of this video, almost 52% of the web uses secure HTTP, otherwise known as HTTPS. So much of the websites you'll try and visit simply won't work. Let's start with the most simple, DOS links. As you saw in the Telnet example of the text mode web browsers, Lynx is a text mode web browser that's actually pretty usable. The interface in DOS Lynx is a bit different than its Linux counterpart, although it's not necessarily a nasty one. I found its performance on a 286 with 640k RAM pretty unbearable, but perhaps I needed to twiddle with the settings some more. There are some more modern browsers that are graphical. For example, Arachne for DOS, it's a thing of genius. It looks and feels like a real web browser. I could get in and run it on a 286 with an EGA display, but oh, it's slower than a geriatric slug on a salted motorway. I believe it will work on an XT class machine, perhaps an 886, but I'd rather stick Fox in my eyes than do that. Dillo requires a 386 processor or better, so I didn't play with it. Pah! The 386 processors are far too new for me. But I hear good things about Dillo, apparently its performance is pretty fast and it feels and looks like a modern web browser should be. It's still being developed to this very day. Quite unbelievably, there are a ton of other internet apps which are available for old DOS computers. There's an SSH2 client as well as an older SSH 1.5 one, an IRC server, various web servers and more besides. 
Too much to go over on this video. I've put all the links to all those goodies in the description, so be sure to view those. Telnet is the father of its secure son, SSH, Secure Shell. Both are most commonly used to connect to remote servers. Let's have a look at an example of telnetting to a BBS. But firstly, what is a BBS? BBS stands for Bulletin Board System. Needless to say, I wasted, mm, invested a lot of my youth on bulletin board systems. This was in the days before the internet went mainstream. Hobbyists made software called bulletin board systems that at their most basic allowed users to write public and private messages to other users that would dial in. Then primitive versions of email started and later interactive chat and then what became known as doors which were additional plugins for BBSs that offered games and other applications. Today, these old school BBSs are still available. Some of them you can even still dial up with an old school modem over a telephone line. However, most have internet connection versions that you can reach with Telnet. Have a look at telnetbbsguide.com for a list of operational BBSs out there and have some fun. There are hundreds of them. I have a few Raspberry Pis kicking around my house. If you don't have one, they're cheap, they're around $100 or less, and they're around the size of a credit card. My MFM drive and my XT died many a year ago, so nowadays I use a compact flash card on my XT as the replacement hard drive. So I've got masses of space left in the case where the hard drive used to be. So I put a Raspberry Pi in there and set it up with Telnet D which is the Telnet server, or daemon, so that I could connect to it and have all the fun. Now here's a demo of web browsing with Elynx, Lynx, W3M and finally Lynx, L-Y-N-X. And these are four different text mode web browsers, you can see a quick comparison here. Then there's other programs such as email software, Pine, and this one shown here, Mutt, and finally a program called Sup as well. For Twitter, there's a few command line clients, but I use OISTTER. There's also the very lovely Rainbow Stream too, but I don't find that really works very well in, in the Telnet session. If I want to get my daily fix of Reddit, there's the client RTV. Uh, Facebook, if I want to use Facebook, I just use the mobile version uh, with W3M. If I want to look at images, I can install Kaka View, which is an ASCII text mode image viewer. And yes, if you want to watch a video in text mode, you can. AA Zyn helps you do that. Here's a slew more of applications that you would find really handy. The text mode editors Vim and Nano. There's BitTorrent. The client there is called CTorrent. Instant Messenger, which is included in the package Pigeon, is called Finch. IRC, of course, we've got IRSSI and WeChat. For file management, there's the Midnight Commander, which is MC. The Network Monitor, IPTRAF. The Video Encoder, FFmpeg. Image Conversion with ImageMagic's Convert Utility. An RSS reader called Canto. The Clock, which is TTY Clock. Word Processing using AntiWord, WordGrinder and Pandoc, which does Microsoft Word doc conversion. Spreadsheet, SC. Presentation, yeah, just like PowerPoint, but for text mode, there is TPP. A calculator, BC. Finally, you can manage multiple windows with tools such as Tmux, Screen, and you can manage those with BYOBU. That's BYOBU. To set up Telnet D on your Linux box, firstly SSH into it as usual, then issue the following commands. Install with sudo apt-get install telnet d-y and on CentOS or RHEL you can do this with sudo yum install telnet-server and then enable the service with systemctl start telnet.socket and systemctl enable telnet.socket. You may need to also unblock telnet on the firewall. You can do so like this. In Ubuntu, sudo ufw allow 23 forward slash tcp. On CentOS, sudo firewall dash command dash dash permanent dash dash add port 
equals 23 forward slash TCP and also sudo firewall dash command dash dash reload. If you have an older or another type of Linux, you may need to use XINETD or some other method. Check with your particular distribution's documentation. If you're using XINETD, check that you have a telnet entry in etc. XINETD.D. If you don't, here's an example entry assuming that you've installed the telnet server daemon. You'll need to restart XINETD by typing sudo service XINETD restart or similar. If you have everything set up correctly, you should now be able to telnet to your Linux box by typing telnet and then the hostname or IP address of the Linux box. Now, a word to the wise, I've configured the Raspberry Pi to run Telnet D so I could do all of this fun stuff. But please remember that Telnet is a clear text protocol. Unlike its offspring SSH, which is encrypted, any information sent between the Telnet server and the Telnet client can be seen with a simple packet sniffer application. If it's used on the same network, it's okay, but treat all of the information, for example, passwords, as if they were sent on the back of a postcard. So there we have it. That is another one of Al's Geek Labs. I uh, thank you very much for watching. If you've got any feedback, good, bad, indifferent, whatever, then give me a shout, hit me up in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe as per usual. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll be back sometime really soon here on Al's Geek Lab. See ya.